your top book. Shh. Am I getting canceled for that? Y'all, the Vietnam War was not fun. Howdy y'all, coming to you live post-nap. Post-nap Nathan here to tell you about a couple of books and then some. If anyone didn't know, I just had the live. <laughs> Uh, did a live with Matthew Schrappa. Thank you again, Matt. You're incredible. I'll leave the link downstairs to our chat. Very, very bookish. I'm right now cataloging all the books that we talked about. It's a doozy. It's a doozy. But yes, hello, everybody. It's your boy, Nate. I read books because reading is sexy. And if you're not reading, you're not sexy. This is the January reading wrap up. I'm cutting it off at January 22nd because I'm going to be quite busy and won't have time to film this. So doing this now. As always, these will be flash reviews of the books. More of these books will be discussed in future vlogs. Okay, let's get into it. We did 13 books for January. Not bad. Not not bad. I started off the year with I Went to See My Father by Kyung Suk Shin. This is about a daughter who is in aid and in company of her father who is um, in the late stages of his life and is recollecting different memories and different memorabilia and letters and discussions and thinking of friends and family and everything and it becomes this giant archival search of who her father is and of Korean history as well. It's a very blue book, very bleak, probably not how I'd want to celebrate the welcoming of 2024, but it's a really Big sad one. Big blue sad one. There's a realism to it, I think, where like really took the joy out of me <laughs> and put me in quite a slump. But I think when we think of our family and how we track family history, this is quite important. After that, to uplift spirits, I did Pure Cosmos Club by Matthew Binder. Thank you, Matthew, for sending me this. This was so, so fun. It's quite a romp. We have her happy-go-lucky artist, Paul. There's this like immense sense of optimism to him that really drives the novel in its absurdist form. He meets these various characters that are just very, very strange. And I think it carries the very heartbeat of New York City and the very rhythm of it and the very different caricatures that you come across in the city. It's written in these very short chapters that makes it feel like such a breeze to run through. Um, but he comes across this cult that sort of changes and implies different agendas in terms of what an artist should be, what an artist should be doing, and what their main purpose is. So it's really Paul looking at purpose, how he reaches his own purpose uh, through his artwork. This was quite a lot of fun. If you want like a quickie, something to get you out of a slump, this will do it for you. After that, I did The Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions by Larry Mitchell. Do this as a buddy read with I'm Alex. Thank you, Alex. I'll leave the handle down below. This is essentially the fabulization of the queer experience. And I think very, very important when we think of archival texts and queer literature and as part of the queer literature canon. There's these gorgeous, fun, whimsical drawings within it and basically tracks the very identities, different kinds of subgroups and uh, people within the queer space and uh, just beautifully detailed here in yeah a fairy tale like way. Larry Mitchell uh, mentions that this originally began as a children's book and so that's why it sort of has these magical fantastic qualities to it but I um, thoroughly enjoyed this and I think incredibly important when we think of queer literary text. Then I had an ARC of Your Utopia by Bora Chung translated by Anton Herr. This is out by Honford Starr. February 13th, look out for it. It's a fun collection of short stories in and around machines and giving machines feeling and sort of these distant, uh, cold feelings and an approach to the world with a story about cannibalism, uh, a robot who has too many feelings. And yeah, it's just such an oddball collection of stories. This very much is in the same vein as Bliss Montage by Ling Ma. So if you enjoy sort of the weird and wondrous way that 
Ling Ma writes, I think you'll really like this. This one has like a, a much colder tone to it, still has that same oddity. The title story, Your Utopia, is the best of the bunch. My intro to her work, and I can't wait to get to Cursed Bunny if I ever do. But yes, fun, fun read. And then I had an ARC of 36 Ways of Writing a Vietnamese Poem by Nam Le. And this is out by Knopf March 5th. I think if you want a collection of fun, fun is probably not the right word, <laughs> but basically clever. Clever is the word I'm looking for. If you're looking for a clever collection of poetry surrounding the Vietnamese experience um, around the war and generational trauma, I think this is really good in the way that it plays with language, both in English and Vietnamese. And uh, there's a circus-like quality to the way he approaches language and neat, fun tricks that fully encapsulates what it means to exist within English through the Vietnamese experience. And it's just very fun. <laughs> Why am I using fun again? Y'all, the Vietnam War was not fun, but the experience of reading this is like trapezing your way through understanding what language can do and the capabilities of it and how actually the weapon is within words and you can do so much with words and the simplicity of words and the placement of them. And it's it's quite f interesting here. Um, Nam has like a very strong control of the language and it's really smart the way that he uses language in his poems. Pick this one up. I've been enjoying a lot of uh, Vietnamese art lately and I'll get to that in a bit later. And then did On Freedom by Maggie Nelson. I can't wait for the book chat with Katie James and her book club. So it'll in essence be a buddy read. Kind of is still an ongoing buddy read. But wow, I don't even know how to unpack this, but we're looking at different ways of freedom. You know, coming into this, I didn't realize how broad that word is, yet how unobtainable it is for so many different kinds of people. When we think of freedom, there is like sexual freedom, financial freedom, artistic freedom, and it goes on and on and on, political freedom. And it really makes you think, Nelson really makes you think about the ways in which we are not free. The more and more we think about freedom and freedom comes at the cost of so many different people, so many different lives. And I don't think that getting freedom is free, unfortunately. There are many losses when we reach freedom and it's explored here a lot. There is a quite stronger, colder uh, academic tone to it in um, comparison to The Art of Cruelty, which I enjoyed a lot more than this, but I think still very important. I mean, you have to give Nelson credit for being able to pull these texts for you, because let's face it, you weren't gonna read any literature in and around freedom and exploring the difference between freedom and liberation, were you? Let's be real. So you gotta give Nelson credit for being able to grab all these texts together and tidy them up in um, a collection of essays like this. Then I had an ARC of Grief is for People by Sloan Crossley. This is out by MCD February 27th. This is about one of her very, very close friends passing away and runs through the very experience of grief in this really humorous and poignant way. It's rich with so much humor and I think that's so important given that like if you look at like The Year of Magical Thinking by uh, Joan Didion, it's a grief book that I always think about and turn to when I think of uh, the topic of grief. It's so cold, so so cold, but here Crosley is able to create this like very rich and heartwarming way of approaching grief and the humor springs up to sort of levy out all of the heavy moments and it's just so, so beautifully done. Yeah, this is my new grief book. If anyone is grieving ever, I think this will put you in better spirits and in ways of understanding grief a bit more. I think any book about grief is always a way of trying to understand it more and more. I don't think we really get answers, but it just makes the experience of handling it a lot easier because we respond so differently to it. There are still so many answers and so many questions in terms of how we get to that. And it's just done so beautifully here. Crosley is just so witty and there's so much love, so much love for her friend there, but also just so much love and the resilience and humanity that we have when we lose someone so close to us. I highly wreck this. It's so, so beautiful. 
Then I had an ARC of comics by Charles Burns. This is out by Fantagraphics, July 9th. Y'all, I told myself I wanted to do more graphic novels in 2024, and I thought this was one of them. This is not a graphic novel, but essentially just a coffee table book of reimagined covers of old comics from the 80s with like this alien odd twist to them all. And it was a lot of fun, but I, I thought it was a graphic novel, but it's literally just cover after cover. So I think it makes like a perfect art book. If you're a fan of Burns, um, I really enjoy his style. There's something grotesque and realistic about it that I thoroughly enjoy. And so if you need a comic table book, of Burns' work. This this is a fun one. Then I had an ARC of Wandering Stars by Tommy Orange. This is out by Knopf February 27th. I did not know this was a sequel of sorts to his breakout novel, There There. This is essentially an attempt to track how generational trauma forms through an intergenerational indigenous narrative. And oh my god, Orange's prose is just so so beautiful. There's just sentences in here that like truly took my breath away and the way that he creates this rhythm within thought patterns and emotions is just so rich and echoes I think in the way family history and story is relayed. You really do see how Orange is able to map out and track where hurt forms and where hurt follows and why teens are the way that they are through this giant cast of characters. I definitely felt like I was missing something in terms of characters, given that I hadn't read There There. So I definitely think you should pick up There There before you pick this one up. But Orange is so wonderful with the way that he uses words. There's something so beautiful about the way his characters navigate and see the world and so, so rich in beauty and detail. Um, so yeah, if you enjoyed There There, definitely pick this up. Okay, I'm sorry, I skipped over a couple of physical reads, but I did Haruki Murakami's Novelist as Vocation. This is not about being a novelist, so y'all, if you are writers out there and you need a book about writing and being a novelist, this is not it. This is essentially an extension pack of what I talk about when I talk about running, which I think is a stronger book about discipline and writing as discipline and sort of creating good habits and better ways of disciplining yourself and doing the work that you need to be doing. But this is basically freeform essays around his life as a writer and it's really grating the way that he talks about being this writer who has sold millions of copies of his books and he's here like, I don't get writer's block and what comes to me comes to me. And he has so much luck and privilege throughout his entire life. And it, it's just sort of really off-putting, if you ask me, um, in terms of how he talks about being a novelist and how he describes his first two novels as kitchen table books. It's just really, there's this like nonchalance about it that's really aggravating, that just put like a bad taste in my mouth. Um, but if you want him talking about writing, I think his running memoir is a lot better than this one. If you are a super fan or a super stan, then definitely pick this up. There's some really interesting minor details about his life in here that is worth reading. But it's essentially him talking about the denuclearization of Japan and school reform, public school reform in Japan. So that's all that is. Then I did Damon Dominique's You Are a Global Citizen. Y'all, just to preface, I love Damon. Damon is incredibly funny and so much fun to watch as a content creator. I just love his travel vlogs and his language stuff too. It's a lot of fun. I think he's one of the best travel vloggers out there. But y'all, this just did not hit, unfortunately. And I feel so bad because I think I was just not the audience for this. And I think most people aren't. I think Damon wrote this for his inner child and for all the kids in middle America who have not yet even been to the coasts of America, who need wanderlust in order to understand that the world is much larger than they are, than the hometown that they grew up in is. And that's it. I feel like most of 
The prompts and questions formulated around being a global citizen and aiming to be that and understanding how much larger the world is were just questions I've always asked myself as someone who is an expat and has lived abroad in certain places. Yeah, this just wasn't made for me. And I think it's for anyone who has literally never left American soil or even has like moved to another city or like has gone on vacation to another city. So yeah, it, it's really, a hard book to put on people because I, I don't necessarily know who it's really for, especially in such an internet heavy age where you can literally go on like virtual walking tours of different cities and such and you can find out so much information and about language through so many different kinds of through YouTube or even TikTok per se and Instagram as well. So I, I'm not quite sure where this is supposed to be and where it's supposed to exist for people. Yeah, just to say, still a Damon fan. Love ya. But this this was not it. Ah! Am I getting canceled for that? Then I did Enigma Variations by Andre Osman. The full review of this, y'all, is that this walked so Call Me By Your Name could run. And that's essentially it. Lust and desire drive the narrative of this book in sort of a short story form of all the loves of this man's life. What's this man's name? Paul. Didn't I just read another Paul in here somewhere? Yes, Pure Cosmos Club. Paul is in love with boys and girls, and it just tracks his different loves throughout his entire life. And yeah, these sort of like short stories. And can we exist solely based on lust and desire? It dwells in sort of the same ways fantasies exist within Call Me By Your Name, spending too much time within fantasy. And where does that take us? Where does that create the verbs that we use in order to ignite love and form love out of lust and desire? But if you enjoy Osman's prose, this is it. And honestly, I think if Luca ever adapted this, it would make so much sense because I feel like Andre and Luca Guadagnino, who adapted Call Me By Your Name, they just get each other so much. Just like all the dinner scenes and the pretentious talks of literature and life and stuff. It just makes so much sense. They should just collab more often, honestly. And then to end my reading month for January, I had an ARC of The Hearing Test by Eliza Barry Callahan. This is out by Catapult, March 5th. Y'all, oof, yummy, yummy, yummy. It's not a five-star read, but it is a top read for me. I found my top read of the year, y'all. A lucky little gem. But it's basically a woman that goes deaf and experiences a Lespector existentialism through a rabbit hole of Cusk characters. So yes, y'all, if you are fans of Lespector and Rachel Cusk, I think you will really, really love this. There's this quiet, muted tone to it, and it's her sort of just trying to re-experience life again, reaffirm all the tiny mundane moments of her life through this like Fleur Yegi prose in trying to re-understand the foundations she already laid out for herself in her life through this hearing loss. And it's just so beautifully written. There are just thought patterns in here that I was just like, what? How? How did she write this? It's not very plotty, but it does have a stronger plot than say, um, a Lispector plot. She just interacts with these different artists within her living conditions that reminds me so much of the Outline Trilogy. There's just many, many brilliant talks about music, literature, painting. That is just what I love about literature so much. If you enjoy all of that, Art Talk, The Spectre, Virginia Woolf, Rachel Cusk, am I selling it to you? Am I selling it to you? Because y'all need to pick this up. And it's a tiny book too. It's like 160 pages. And I pretty much highlighted, I think, the entire, like, half of this book. So it's a real treat. I loved it so much. Um, and y'all need to pick it up. I swear, I swear. And yeah, that is all the books I read in January. I'll probably read more, but this is all I have time for, for a wrap up. I read that many books and usually I do more, but also because I watched 65 movies already, y'all. <laughs> and I think I'm hitting 66 today. Uh, but any mentionables, also don't freak out, y'all. Don't freak out. Half of these were short films, so don't freak out. Ooh, I finally watched The Color of Pomegranates. This is up in 1969. It's a giant piece of poetry surrounding this poet from the ancient world. And it just the visuals are so, so stunning. I could literally watch this again. 
played in the background of like a house party. Good time, y'all. Good time. Definitely wreck. Yeah, I mean, I just, I don't want to name drop just a bunch of movies, but I did All That Jazz from 1979. It's this huge, beautiful tapestry of the theater experience. So many different emotions that run high and I think basically encapsulates the very experience of like how much blood, sweat, and tears goes into a theater production. Super over the top and wonderful. Oh, I finally did Tex 1138, THX 1138 by George Lucas. And oh my God, so beautifully shot. It's minimalism at its finest in a sci-fi dystopian world. It's so underlooked, I think, in terms of George Lucas's career. I think, sure, we immediately think of Star Wars, but this I just love. It's so, so many questions exist in here and it's one of his smarter philosophical works. And I wish he did more of this, but exists in the same realm of like 2001 A Space Odyssey. There's just something so muted about it as well. Very interesting camera work and techniques within shots. Requires a couple more rewatches as well. There's a bunch of questions and still answers to seek out within this one. It's a lot of fun. Ooh, <laughs> I did want to say I finally did Evolution of a Filipino Family, my first and probably last Lab Diaz film, but it's essentially a 10 hour movie. <laughs> a 10 hour movie, y'all. I did it. It was insane. I think peak cinema. This is a testament to film and what film can do and achieve and portray, but it basically tracks, yeah, this evolution of a Filipino family from countryside to the city um, under the martial law of the Marcos family. It took 12 years to film and basically just captures 10 years of the life of a Filipino family. And it's insane. There, something happens. I mean, something happens within you when you watch a 10 hour movie. I had to do this within parts, so it took me about a week to finish. Any art that I plan to create or has been created has just been done ultimately within this film when we talk about art as activism um, and what it can achieve and do. This is it. No other film needs to exist. Like, it's all here. And ooh, sort of my last film to mention is The Scent of Green Papaya. This was released in 1993 by Jan Anhum and uh, he's quickly become one of my favorite directors, even though his filmography is quite small, especially his Vietnamese films. This is so, so poetic. It's such a sensual film. All your senses are touched here. There's just a sensuous quality to his films. It's not about anything, really. It's about this uh, house servant, a little girl who enters the life of this family and works for them and then grows up to love one of the neighbors. It's just such a sweet, delicate film and the way that it examines all these very minute and mundane parts of life and the way the camera sweeps in to capture everything is just so insane to me. It feels so orchestrated. Like there's this intense choreography to everything, but I really can't explain what it is because it really is just the Vietnamese experience and growing up and what it means to be Vietnamese. And like, if you don't get the film, then I don't think you'll ever get the Vietnamese experience. And that's okay, because you know what? More for me, more for me. I was crying and there's really nothing to cry about, but there are moments in here. I was just like blown away by it because so rich in detail and just details that echo, I think, the way my family has existed, the way my last name has existed for so many of my family members, that's, it just, echoes generations of my family that I don't know how to relay to you, but it's just captured so beautifully as portrait here. And I'm so sad to know that like, I'm almost done with this filmography. And if anyone didn't know, he did the film adaptation for Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. And I don't think it was that great, but yeah, I have one Vietnamese film left by him and I'm so sad that that's it that's it that's all I get but it's the vertical ray of the sun if anyone was wondering but oh yeah the scent of green papaya so so beautifully done I think we'll end up in my film canon y'all thanks for being here I love y'all it's the first reading wrap-up of the year can you believe it I think I'm gonna hit 52 books real soon uh with the rate I'm going at um and that's fine that's fine I think we'll do fine just for 2024. 
I've got some really interesting reads coming up and really excited to get to them. As always, let me know what your top book, shh. Let me know what your top book of 2024 has been in the month of January. Have you hit one? Have you got one already? Let me know, put it down in the comments. I'd like to know. As always, be well, do good work, keep in touch.